All right, welcome to Blackhawk Church. My name is Chris, I'm one of the pastors on the teaching team here at Blackhawk. Welcome to those of you who are with me uh, in this uh, venue and those of you who are watching on a screen, uh, maybe it's in this, uh, at this site, the Brader Way site, or maybe it's downtown uh, Blackhawk, or maybe it's in Fitchburg. And for those of you who are part of our Blackhawk Chinese uh, ministry, Di Zhong Xipei, Ping An. Welcome to Blackhawk Church. Today's talk, I want to start off with a kind of a word association. So you know how those things go. So I say a word and then you say what comes into your mind. So for example, it would go like this. If you said to me, Chicago, I would say, there you go. So you understand how the, word, the, the game is played, okay? So you can say it out loud or just think it. Here you go, ready? Green Bay. Bears. Bucky. Bears. Pumpkin. Bears. Sin. Bears. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay, that didn't, okay. So that's mean of me, wasn't it, to do that kind of thing? So anyway, I've had to turn a corner here a little bit. So uh, why did I do that? So I have no idea what came into your mind when I said the word uh, sin, and um, some of you said, ah. And so that's probably the, that's a good, good response right there. Um, I'm not a psychic, I don't know, maybe different kinds of things come into your mind when I say sin, or you just kind of just freeze right there and say, I'm not saying anything out loud, that's for sure. And it's probably a good thing that I don't know what comes into your mind when I say the word sin. But I know what doesn't come into your mind. I don't know what you would say when I say sin, but I'm pretty sure I know that something that you wouldn't say. Probably the word sin doesn't make us think of what we're doing right now, being in a worship service. Sin might make us think of racism or cheating or lying or murder or sex or something like that, but when I say the word sin, probably no one at this side or any of the venues would say a worship service. But actually, what we're doing now what you're actually participating in right now, whether you're at this side or another side, could actually be very sinful, very offensive to God. If we're going through an experience, but we're not really involved in an encounter with God, that, from his perspective, is sin. Let me illustrate. My wife and I are about ready to go on a vacation, and uh, while we're on vacation, uh, let's say that I decide to take my wife out to dinner. And let's say say that I decide to take her to uh, not one of my favorite places, like Chick-fil-A or Culver's or something like that, but I actually like to take her to like a place that she really wants to go. You know, like a sit-down place. My wife calls these May I Help You restaurants. So I take her to a May I Help You restaurant and uh, there's actually a little candle with a flame and uh, someone comes and says, may I help you? And the evening is just set up perfectly. And then I say to my wife, you know what? I wanna really, I wanna really have you talk to me tonight. Instead of me just blabbing on, I just, I want, let's talk about our future and I want you to talk about what's on your heart right now. And so she goes, oh, no, you don't. I said, yeah, yeah, I do, yeah, I do. So she goes, what's wrong? And I said, oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. So then finally, after a few little things like that, we, she starts to actually starts talking. And then I can see that she's very serious and she's pouring kind of her heart and her soul out. She's very, it's really, really, we're getting into a deep conversation. And then all of a sudden, oh, oh, just a second here. Oh, just a second. So it's church. No, there's no problem here. Just a second. And then, uh, it's okay, okay. Okay, now, what were you saying? And then she talks a little bit more. And then, oh, just a second, just a second. It's a, it's a, it's a group text. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, like... So where were we? (laughs) If I did that to my wife, (laughs) would I be in trouble? 
oh my gosh. If I said, oh, come on, honey, I really want to hear, I mean, whoa, I would never say that because I know I'm just going to get the wrath of Becky right there. <laughs> because I'm, I'm not really interested in her. I'm easily distracted. <laughs> what would be even worse than that is that like after that dinner, if someone calls me and I go, Oh, yeah, I just went on a date with my wife. You know, date with, you know, I'm a good guy. I go on a date with my wife. Man, it was fantastic. It was really good. And if she heard me say that, whoa. Because I was going through an experience, but I didn't really care about the depth of the encounter. Same thing can happen here. You can go through an experience, like you know, check off the box, I've gone to worship, I'm going to go sing, I'm going to go listen to a talk, go through these kind of things and say, oh, just a second, God, just a second. I'm thinking about something else. Thinking, what is it? Like, where were we? And then the, the worst thing is that, like in the atrium afterwards, if someone says, hey, how'd you like the worship service? You go, oh my, this is a great worship service. I was... <laughs> And the important issue is not what we thought about the worship service, but what did God actually think about that service and your participation in that service? And if you were involved in a check-the-box experience and it wasn't an encounter with the living God, Yahweh calls that sin. It's extremely offensive to him. That's what we're going to talk about today. Take your Bibles and turn to Amos chapter 4. Amos 4. We're in the third of a six-part series as we're going through the book of Amos and we're calling this series Blind Spots. Amos is delivering a series of difficult, hard messages to the people that live in Israel a long, long time ago. And he's calling attention to their blind spots and we don't want to fall into the same blind spots that they had. Here's the calendar of kind of where we are. Uh, Last week, I actually talked about the idea of tribalism, the blind spots of the outsiders. And today we're going to talk about uh, the worship. Next week, Pastor Charles is going to talk about the blind spot and what it means to actually seek God The week after that, Pastor Ben's going to talk about how to hear God, and then the last week, Pastor Kayla's going to talk about the blind spots on judgment and hope. But today, we're going to talk about this idea of a blind spot when it comes to worship, Amos 4. Let's remember, first of all, what Amos is doing. So he is a prophet from Judah, but he's speaking to people in Israel. And he's doing that about 760 years before Christ. So chronologically, it would be like this. If I'm standing like this represents David, David lived a thousand years before Christ. He had a son who became king. His name was Solomon. Solomon died in 930 BC, 930 years before Christ. When he died, the kingdom split into two two sections in the north Israel in the south Judah. About 150 years after it split, that's the context of where we're talking today. Amos chapter 4 verse 4. Go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years. Burn leavened bread as a thank offering and brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites, for this is what you love to do, declares the sovereign Lord. So obviously, Amos is using sarcastic mockery and he's being very sarcastic at this point. So what's wrong here? What's the problem? What does he mean when he says, go to Bethel and sin? Go to Gilgal and sin? Well, let's remember, the Bible's not written to us. It's written for us. It's not written to us. If it was written to us, we'd all know the answer to that question. The question is, what, what's happening at Bethel and Gilgal? Well, if you're an Israelite, you would know exactly that. So let's go back into their history and see what they were doing at Bethel and Gilgal. 
So take your Bibles and go back to 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings 12. And this will kind of help us set the context. So remember uh, that Israel divided after the death of Solomon into two sections. In the north, the king in Israel was called Jeroboam. This is Jeroboam the first, 150 years later. In Amos' day, it's Jeroboam the second. This is the first. And then in the south, Judah is reigned by a person named Rehoboam. And there you could see on this map, Judah's in the south, and then there's Bethel, it's in Israel, and Gilgal's in Israel, and way to the north, there is Dan. So here historical narrative, we listen to the king Jeroboam. Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. That would be in Jerusalem and that would be Judah. If these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me in return to King Rehoboam. After seeking advice, the king, Jeroboam, made two golden calves. He said to the people, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel, and the other in Dan. And this thing became a what? Because sin, people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. All right, let's go back to Amos chapter four, verse four. Go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years. So what they were doing is that they were going through a worship experience, but they were not having an encounter with the living God. And they were proud of their experience. They were like, oh yeah, we're worshiping, we're worshiping. Yeah, this is important to Yahweh. We're doing the right thing, we're doing the right thing. This is not what God wants you to do at all. But they didn't care about what God said. They just cared about what was good for themselves. So you can see they loved doing this. Look at verse four and five again. Go to Bethel and sin, go to Gilgal and sin, yeah, and we'll bring your sacrifices every morning. So they did this a lot. These are religious, these are religious people. Your tithes every three years, probably better translations, every three days. They're religious people. They did this all the time. Boom, 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 boom. Always going, always going, always going. Oh, this is awesome. God's got to be pleased with us. Burn leavened bread as a thank offering. Brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites, for this is what you love to do, declares the sovereign Lord. Look at me, look at me. Hey, going, going to the temple. This is good, awesome. Check that box, check that box, check that box. But Yahweh was far from their worship. They didn't care what Yahweh said. They were just into the experience themselves. Because it made them so good about themselves. Hey, how'd you like the worship service today? Oh, I thought it was pretty cool. So it was good service. That's not the important question. <laughs> the important question is, what did Yahweh, what does Yahweh think? about the worship service. Well, so Yahweh uh, decides that since these people are sinning so much, he, he wants to discipline them. And so he, he brings like plagues on them. He brings curses on them. And Amos is going to say that God brought no food to them. He brought no rain to them, no life to them, no victory to them. And these curses that Amos is about ready to go through, uh, to us they're not that familiar, but to an Israelite, if they knew the Torah, Deuteronomy 28 especially, they would have known every one of these things. The Lord said, this is what's gonna happen. If you treat me this way, (laughs) it's offensive to me. This is what I'm gonna do to you. He warned them in Deuteronomy 28, and everything he said in Deuteronomy 28, he's basically, Amos is saying, yep, this is gonna happen. Here are the five curses. Amos chapter four, verse six, no food. I gave you empty stomachs in every city and a lack of bread in every town, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Then no rain. 
I also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still there, three, three months away. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none and dried up. People staggered from town to town for water, but it did not get enough to drink. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Then no crops. Many times I struck your gardens and vineyards, destroying them with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your fig and olive trees, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord, and no life. I sent plagues among you as I did to Egypt, killed your young men with the sword along with your captured horses. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord, and then no victory. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were like a burning stick snatched from the fire, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. The Lord knows that when bad things happen to people, many times that causes people to turn to God. Immediately you get a a bad cancer, you turn to God. There's a tornado that happens, there's a flood that happens, you turn to God. In January of 2010, when Haiti was devastated by earthquakes and hundreds of thousands of people died, our press from this country was surprised when they went down to Haiti to find the people walking around in the rubble, turning to praise God and sing praises to God and to worship him. Sometimes crises lead people to God. Happened here in our country on 9-11, which was on a Tuesday. On a Wednesday, all the churches in this city and synagogues were filled with people. Hardships and crises, difficult times, often cause people to turn to God. So he brings hardships on them. Do they turn back to him? The answer is, No, you see that repetition. Yet you failed to return to me over and over and over again. So God gives them a promise. And his promise is, I'm on my way. Prepare to meet your God. That's verse 12. Therefore, this is what I will do to you, Israel. And because I will do this to you, Israel, Prepare to meet your God. He who forms the mountains, who creates the wind, and who reveals his thoughts to mankind, who turns dawn to darkness and threads on the heights of the treads on the heights of the earth, the Lord God Almighty is his name. That English phrase translates uh, this phrase uh, in Hebrew, Adonai Elohilu, Sabaot, Yahweh. God of Sabaoth is the idea of some of your Bible saying God of hosts. It's the phrase that's a very common phrase in Hebrew Bible it's repeated 285 times. It's about the fact that God is sovereign, God is powerful. We're talking about the God of the universe here. Verse 13 uh, says, He who forms the mountains, who creates the wind. Look at verse 13, who turns dawn, who turns the dawn to darkness. Not, not the darkness to dawn, but the dawn, the hopefulness of a brand new day. Yeah, he can turn that to darkness. And he will turn that to darkness. He's about ready to unleash Assyria onto Israel. Prepare to meet your God. Because Israel had a huge blind spot. They thought their experiences equaled an encounter and yet they were too busy with their, what they thought was worship. And they didn't really listen to what God was saying. And he was offended by it. All right. Have a good day. <laughs> so this is typical Amos right here. This is Amos. This is Amos right here. So uh, how does this affect our life? What would be a next step uh, for us? So we want to avoid a blind spot of being people who go, yep, went to church today, yeah, was, yep, there you go, I did my thing. We want to be a people who kind of avoids that. We want to be people who actually our experience does help us encounter God. 
So I thought we would get real practical here at Blackhawk today and talk with someone who uh, really thinks about worship here at all sites and venues like pretty much uh, all uh, the time. He's kind of a leader over all things uh, worship. He is the lead pastor for this particular site, the Brader Way site. Why don't you welcome to the platform Joel Hasensaw. Welcome, Joel. All right, man. Okay, good. Good to see you. So normally Joel is up here playing the guitar, but now you're going to preach. Awesome. Yeah, that's like my worst fear right there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's great. Awesome. Thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, doing this. So, Joel, let me just ask you a question that I get asked a lot uh, at Blackhawk Church, and you know things about our worship services. This is one of the th- main questions I get. How many worship services do we actually have at Blackhawk Church? Yeah, I think I had to actually like count all of these up this week, but we have three sites, our downtown site, our Fitchburg site, and then here at Brader Way. And here at Brader Way, we have a number of venues that take place throughout the day. So all told, there's 14 services that go on somewhere on a given Sunday. That's seven different worship teams. So a lot of my job historically has been just kind of directing traffic and making sure a whole lot of different worship leaders and different teams know what's taking place and what's going on for that particular Sunday. Yeah, so how many volunteers does it take to do worship around here? Yeah, there's uh, upwards of 200 volunteers who are worship leaders, who are musicians on one of the teams, uh, or many who you don't see. They're in the tech booths running different aspects of the technical side of the service, and they are amazingly gifted people, and it's awesome to get to work with them. So I count that a huge privilege. Yeah, the quality is so high. Many people think everybody on the platform uh, are you know, paid staff, and that's not true at all. There's probably maybe, there might be one paid staff, and everybody else is a volunteer. So do we have a great group of volunteers, you guys? Let's hear for our volunteers. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so this is, uh, you think about worship here with your team all the time. So what would you say is like the main thing? What would be the foundation as you guys go into a meeting? Yeah, worship is simply ascribing worth or value to something or someone. So we do this um, in all kinds of different contexts throughout our week, whether we cheer on the Badgers, whether we go belt out a song at one of our favorite concerts, uh, whatever we might put our resources or time or energy towards, we are saying through doing those things, we're saying that something or someone is worthy of our time, of our resources, of my singing to belt out that song or whatever it might be. So we do this all, all sorts of times. Yeah, you're, um, we're, uh, you're, we're actually trying to get people to stop thinking about themselves for a few minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so here in our context, we think in terms of uh, we're ascribing that worth and that value to the God of the universe. And so it gives us a chance as we gather in community to step away from um, kind of the noise and to recognize that in whatever we're bringing into the room, uh, we can place the focus and the attention on a God who is worthy. And that's what we want these services to be about. Yeah, amen. So um, how do you see this playing out in terms of your preparing and a plan for what we do on Sundays? Yeah. Uh, Every week, there's all kinds of different ways that we uh, worship together. Um, We come in, obviously, singing is a big component to that. Uh, So we sing together. We use different words um, to ascribe worth and value to our God. We uh, learn through teaching, and so that's a big component to our service. That's 35 minutes of the time that we have together. Yeah, which is where we interface a lot. That's exactly right. So we have 65 minutes for these services, you guys, and we try to stay at 65 minutes. And many times when we go over, it's guess whose fault that is usually yeah there you go so uh, the 35 minute talk all the talks by the teaching team you guys are finished three weeks ahead of that particular Sunday so we do that so that the worship teams Joel's teams can have this they know where the message is going so it helps you guys That gives us a chance to think about the other elements that are part of the service. Uh, We worship through teaching and music, obviously. We worship through um, taking the Lord's Supper together, and that's kind of reenacting God's covenant relationship with us. We worship together through giving. We worship together uh, through hearing stories of God at work. Uh, Usually that's a God at work in so many of you and his faithfulness. And so those are all different themes, different ways that we engage in worship. And we try, our teams and our leaders, uh, work hard to try and tie those themes together based on what we're teaching about that week, based on a story we might be telling. Um, and that's part of what we see the role of the worship yeah. leader. So, and, but singing is important, and we do a lot of that. I mean, if you look at the Psalms, you guys, they're filled with commands 
to sing. I mean, God wants us to sing. So there must be something about that. Yeah. Uh, we obviously love singing. I think many people probably think in terms of a song is a song, right? You know, but I think for us, we think in terms of some songs are celebratory. They're intended to kind of declare who God is and what he's about. Uh, some songs are prayers. A lot of our songs are prayers because they're directed right to the God of the universe. And they're intended for him to be able to do his kind of work in us. And we're opening our hearts up to him to do that work. Some songs are laments to like what's broken around our world or in our lives. Some songs are responses to his goodness and his grace. Uh, where we can naturally say, we want to be the kind of people you want us to be. God, how do we do that? Uh, we want to respond to you. So we see songs as prayers, and we see songs in a bunch of different ways as inviting us to experience and uh, relate to the God of the universe. Yeah, so there are 158 hours in any week, and really one of those hours, really, we have a team of people that is thinking about what you're going to be doing for 65 minutes, at least, uh, of your week. So let's get real practical. What suggestions would you have to uh, the audience here about what they can do to engage and prepare to engage God? Yeah. I think I would say first and foremost, um, we really want church to be a place where you can engage uh, in connecting with God in some kind of meaningful way. And so we don't want it to feel like you're just kind of checking the box, like, hey, I did my church thing that week, and I'm good. I'm good to go now for the rest of the week. We'll be back next week. Uh, we want it to be a place where you can have a meaningful encounter with God. And so we hope for that as we put services together. And we also see the community part as a huge part of what we value about that. Uh, you can worship God throughout your week in all kinds of different ways, uh, but there's kind of one gathering of God's people that takes place during the course of the week, and that's what we're doing here in our services. Yeah, let me just take a second uh, to actually speak to those of you who are watching online. We'll, we normally get about a thousand hits on uh, the talk for a given Sunday, so many of us are traveling. We can't make the you know service, and we get that totally. Uh, but uh, there is something about gathering together that God wants us uh, to do. Sometimes we're sick or we're traveling, we just can't do that. But we wanna encourage those of you who are watching uh, online to actually engage in community uh, and uh, don't make it a regular part of your life just to say, well, I'm just watching the talk. There's so much more to worship than just watching a talk. And then there are a lot of people who are in another city and we know that you're watching we're telling you, get involved in a local church someplace in your area because you can watch the talk, but so much more happens as we gather together in community. Yeah, and we believe as we, um, like authentic worship is not just checking your circumstances and your life at the door before you come in. Uh, we, with our teams, with the way that we uh, talk about it, we want to invite people with stories, with real situations with circumstances going on in their lives to enter into a place like this and to worship God through whatever might be going on. So for some of you, you might have had a great week and it's really easy. And we say things like this every once in a while. It's easy to come in and say, you are God and you are good. For others of you, it, it could have been a really hard week. And I've had seasons like this in my own life. And it could be a really hard week. And it's not easy to say you are God and you are good because it's not easy to see what he's up to and what he's doing. And I imagine in large spaces like this, there are people kind of at every step along the way between those two. And we just want this to be a place where you can come in. You don't have to check your life stories at the door. You don't have to have it all together. But you come in and you're invited to worship God in the midst of whatever he might be doing in your life. And we believe that that's authentic. It's more authentic uh, to be that kind of community where that's possible. So we long for that. And we want that as you come into these, yeah, these we, sorts of rooms. We are just like, you know, God, you know, Lord God Almighty. So we are wanting you to encounter him and people encounter him in various uh, different kinds of ways. So our goal is that you would stop thinking about yourself and then you would encounter Lord God Almighty. And one, th one thing that's really cool about that is we don't always know what's going on for the person next to us. We don't always know what the story is. And so there's times where I hear from people, man, I, don't, I didn't really connect with that song or that, you know, that didn't resonate with me. And that's okay. Um, I think in rooms like this, you can guess that probably it's resonating with somebody. And part of the value of being in community like this together is that we can say, in joining our voices together, whether it's resonating as much for you as it might be for someone else, that we believe it's valuable to worship our God through the whole range of human experience and to do that in community together and supporting one another through that. So let's just be honest. There are some people who just don't like to sing. 
So what, what would you say to those folks? Uh, we're glad you're here, first and foremost. Um, I think I would say, maybe to go back to a sermon series we did this summer, uh, Heart, Head, Hands. There are different types of things that connect with different sorts of people, and we know this. And so um, we try and always have something that's accessible to every single person through the course of a service. It may not, every part of the service may not be your favorite thing, but we want there to be something that's easy for you to grab onto. So for some of you, you might be heart people, you love the more emotional connections, music is easy for you to kind of enter into, you love singing, awesome. And so we want that to be something that propels you into learning more of who Christ is, kind of engaging the head side of things, and to serving and being a part of what God is doing in our community and our world through your hands. And so this is oversimplifying, and I would encourage you to go back and listen to that three-week series from this July. Um, but for some of you, you might be head people. Like you love, um, more than anything else, you love learning something new. And the kind of the cerebral aspects of what happens in our service are really valuable to you. And I would, for you, I would say, and many of you I know are some of the ones who really don't love singing, and that's okay. Um, for many of you, I just want to say, let the learning, let those things that are really engaging your mind be things that propel you to really explore the contents of your heart and how you can offer the contents of your heart to God in worship. That's what we truly believe is happening as we um, have an encounter with the God of the universe. Some of it is learning, certainly, and growing. Some of it is about understanding how our souls long to know the God of the universe and live and experience his life. And so we encourage you that way. For some of you, you might be hands people. Um, you are easily motivated to serving others, whether it's here in our church community, whether it's uh, outside these walls to different parts of the community around us. And that is awesome, and we love that. And we want you continuing to do that. I would just encourage you, um, grab onto some of the aspects of learning who Christ is, what he's done for us. Grab onto some of the emotional aspects of what takes place and let those engage your heart so that you have a strong foundation to why you serve and what you do. And so we encourage you that way. Yeah, uh, all of these things, our head, our heart, our hands, are, they're so important, especially what we uh, do. And as uh, we continue in the book of Amos next uh, week, uh, you'll see that um, Pastor Charles will talk about this whole idea of uh, worship uh, for Israel was disconnected from what they did. So they were a people of injustice and God is going to come down really hard on them uh, next week. Well, not next week, but you know what I'm saying. So because of the disconnect uh, between justice and if we, don't, if we don't care about justice and poverty and we say we worship God, yeah, that really makes God angry. So we'll see that uh, next week. So Joel, thank you uh, so much. Uh, let's hear it for this guy uh, right here, Joel Hosenzal. So I'd like to have all the worship leaders uh, at all the sites and venues right now come on uh, to the worship uh, platform in your various sites and venues. Joel's going to lead his team. And uh, we're going to do something we don't normally do. We're going to sing one song uh, together, not at the same time, but we're all, all sites and venues are going to sing the same song. And it's this song, How Great uh, Thou Art. And before we sing that song, though, and as we focus on God, let's read uh, chapter 4, verse 13. Uh, together. At all sites and venues, read this aloud with me. Here we go. He who forms the mountains, who creates the wind, and who reveals his thoughts to mankind, who turns dawn to darkness and treads on the heights of the earth, the Lord God Almighty is his name. <laughs> 